Yes, sir. Spandex. Detective J. Thorpe Jr. T H O R P E. Yeah. Jim. This, yeah. It's about Good to go morning, down, man. Detective. Yeah, I've been waiting morning, for you a little second. Yeah. Uh, fine. Little. Good. Yeah. Uh, Detective Thorpe, uh, would you please introduce yourself to the jury by telling them where it is you currently work? Yes, ma'am. Detective Jim Thorpe Jr., City of Atlanta. Hang on just a second. You're going to have to use the mic, Miss Love. Can you hear the witness? Yes, ma'am. All right. It's about to get real spandexy in here. All right. If everyone can hear me and can stand the static, I'm going to use this Thank one. You. Skims. Thank you. Uh, would you go ahead? I apologize. Tell the jury where it is that you currently work. Yes, ma'am. I currently work City of Atlanta Police Department Homicide Unit. How long have you worked at the City of Atlanta Police Department in the Homicide Unit? I work with the City of Atlanta now for 30 years and nine months. All right. Have you worked as a homicide the entire time? Yes, ma'am, 20 years. Now, 30 years and nine months and 20 years are different. So what did you do when you first started working with Atlanta Police Department? Uh, my first okay. assignment. They cannot hear you if you don't use the mic. And I'm sorry that it's staticky. Maybe one day we can get that fixed also. But we're just going to have to endure the static. He first 48. Yes, Your Honor. Try to minimize it. What did you do when you first started working with the Atlanta Police Department? Yes, ma'am. I was the first assignment was the Atlanta Police Zone 3 Precinct, Evening Watch, Mobile Patrol. That would have been in what year that you started that? Um, I started Mobile Patrol in 95. What types of activities did you conduct as a Zone 3 Evening Watch Mobile Patrol officer? Um, answering 911 calls, dealing with all types of calls of uh, accidents, um, suspicious persons, shootings, robberies, burglaries, car thefts. Okay. There we go. Yes, ma'am. And tell the jury what parts of Zone 3 you patrolled as a patrolman in Zone 3 Evening Watch. Just to let you know, this is Detective Thorpe, first 48. And the first detective to investigate Donovan Thomas. And I believe he was on Atlanta Homicides, too. Don't quote me on that. But, yeah. And when he on First 48, he a whole gopher. Yeah. Oh, and he interrogated um, Woody. And DK. Don't quote me on that. He interrogated Woody and told, he the one that told Woody that Woody could have the, uh, the yes door. Yeah. Line Woody up. Then start flexing on him and cursing when he came back and he had him locked up. But at first he was cool with Woody in the video. Like, nah, bro, you can have a straight. You could defend yourself. Who told you you couldn't defend yourself? That was him. Yeah, remember he had the, the, the ball head that was shining like it was police car lights? Red and blue? Yeah, that was him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then um, the beat I was assigned was called 304. And that beat was mostly around um, Metropolitan Parkway, Sylvan Road, um, leading up to Cle Cleveland Avenue and Lakewood Avenue. How much of Cleveland Avenue did you patrol? Um, it would depend on if we were short an officer, they would re reposition um, my team. It was two officers assigned to the beat 304. So either one of us could get pulled and use around Cleveland Avenue. That was the 308 beat. And um, we pretty much control all of Cleveland, 75, 85, north and south, uh, Jonesboro Road and all this streets surrounding Old Hayville and streets like that. Okay. As a homicide detective, are you restricted to one zone only or do you work the entire city of Atlanta? We work the entire city of Atlanta. Are you familiar with um, the neighborhood surrounding Cleveland Avenue and including Cleveland Avenue today? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell the jury whether it's different, the same, or in some ways both to 95 as between today and then? Uh, Sustained. All right. Would, how do you describe the neighborhood of Cleveland Avenue back in 1995? How would you describe it in terms of the community? Um, community, um, 
lack of better terminology, wasn't um, aggressive. Um, the, that part of the Cleveland Avenue really, really was not a high crime area or gang activity uh, respondent back, back in 95 to 97. And that was the length of time that you worked evening patrol, 95 to 97? Yes, ma'am. And typically what types of crimes did you have the most opportunity to respond to in that area? Relevance. Ever ruled. Um, mostly uh, shootings, um, like I said, robberies, mm -hmm. burglaries, things of that nature. Would you describe for the jury your, um, you mentioned there was not a lot of particular kind of activity. Uh, did that change? Has that changed today? Yes, ma'am. Is there a particular kind of crime that you see more of today that you did not see back in 95? Yes, ma'am. Would you tell the jury what types those are? Um, mostly gang activity shootings, related shootings. Now, after you left Evening Watch Patrol of Zone 3, what station did you take up at APD? Yes, ma'am. I was uh, transferred to the uh, Red Dog Unit, uh, Evening Watch and Day Watch. How long did you work the Red Dog Unit? About three to four years. Now, after the Red Dog Unit, what was your assignment? Were you a part of the Red Dog Unit that was prosecuted for the bar situation? Um, I was promoted from the Red Dog Unit to a detective, and my first assignment was the burglary unit. And what year was that? 2000. About 2000, yes, ma'am. Prior to joining the Atlanta Police Department, would you tell the jury what your education was? Yes, ma'am. Um, Graduated high school on time, um, associate's degree, and at that time I went into the military, U.S. Army. How long did you serve in the Army? Wow. If you know, you know. And if you do, leave a comment about that. If you know me, you know what time it is, baby. Thank you for your service, sir. Uh, roughly about six years. And what was your station? What was your job in the Army? Um, without getting into too much detail, just generally speaking. Soldier. Okay. Are you originally from Atlanta? No, ma'am. Did you come to Atlanta after you left the Army? No, ma'am. I was here. Okay. After... What, if you're not from Atlanta, where are you from? You joined the burglar unit. Tell the jury what your responsibilities included. Um, investigating burglaries, um, whether it was commercial or residential burglaries. Was there a particular area of Atlanta you were responsible for? Yes, ma'am. Uh, my primary zone was the zone one, and my secondary was zone three. What area of zone one were you responsible for? I'm sorry about that, that static. That's fine. Uh, we believe if anyone's familiar with the Bluff area, um, Donnelly, Hollowell, Hollywood Road, Everything over in, in that general region, Perry, Perry Boulevard. Hang on one second. I'm trying to solve this problem. Bro. It's pretty Burglar unit. Two years. After the burglar unit, what did you do? I was, I was transferred to the robbery unit. Yeah. Is that me, Judge, or is that... Um... I have no idea. <laughs> it's right, him. Just, what? Yo, listen, listen, listen. That dude over there playing with wires. Let me explain something being an audio engineer. If you playing with your wires and the mic making that noise while you playing with the wires, something ain't right. Yo using a cable he shouldn't even be using because my cable shouldn't even be able to do that. I'm keeping it real. All right. If she on a wireless mic and it's doing that, something ain't right. So Holmes over there playing with wires right now, that means they got the wrong wires. I'm going to just let y'all know. Let's keep it going, though. What was your position with the robbery unit? A uh, detective. Okay. And um, my zone, primary zone was zone three. The secondary zone was zone one. Were you patrolling the same or responsible for the same area in the robbery unit as you had been when you were in a zone three evening watch patrol officer? Yes, ma'am, so I had this whole, the whole entire zone. Okay. I mean, yes, the whole entire zone, right. A sector and B sector. Uh, did you interact often with the residents of zone three? Yes. During your time as a patrol officer and as a 
detective in the robbery unit? Yes, ma'am. Was your interaction only when you were arresting people or investigating suspects? No, ma'am. What other types of interactions did you have? Um, at that time, um, I was also working a part time as a Atlanta public school resource officer. And the school I was assigned was the Crawford Long Middle School, okay. which is right off of Cleveland Avenue. Would you tell the jury what years those were that you worked as a Crawford Long Middle School resource officer? Um, I would say it'd be from 2001 to 2012, 2013. And what were your responsibilities as a resource officer with Crawford Long? Primarily um, maintaining the safety and security of the school. Um, Yo, do y'all hear like a ring effect when he talk? What's that? And it sound like it's only in the left ear. Y'all hear that? Walking around, patrolling the grounds, making sure uh, the teacher's cars or anyone visiting school wasn't cars were getting broken in, things of that nature. Did you have interaction with the students outside of investigating car break-ins and the like? Yes, ma'am. And would you describe for the jury what types of interactions that you'd have with the students at Crawford Long Middle School? Oh. Your, Your Honor, as it pertains to particular people that are... Um, involved in this case, his knowledge of them and the jury's awareness right, of his foundation. His attention to that. Did you interact with um, with the course indulgence? I'd just like to ask a broader question and narrow it down. I won't be, I won't prolong that. Uh, did you interact with the students and converse with them on a personal level? Yes, ma'am. Did you interact with the students I know they ain't got shorty talking on a sure SM57. What is that? She on she on a real rock mic, a rock and roll stage mic. What is that? Parents at times. Yes, ma'am. Um, did you interact with uh, a student by the name of Quindaria Zachary? Yes, ma'am. Describe your what? What? That's what we doing? Holmes was a school police and was dealing with Quindaria Zachary. Yo. Were, um, when you first met Quindarius Zachary, how old was he? I say he had to be about 11 years old. And. And this was around the time that the schools was doing that little test scandal thing. You was at one of those schools. What school was this, bro? Uh oh. Who oh, remember when I was trying to connect the pieces? I said, yo, I bet some of these kids in this trial was going to school during. So it's directly connected to that. Hold up. I know we ain't luck up like that. We got a detective was working at the school too. Gee whiz. In what capacity did you interact with him? Was it? Usually times when he was misbehaving and I would just take him to the side and talk to him rather than seeing him being suspended or suffering school punishment, I try to talk, talk the kids to the side, get them out of trouble, and then once again, put them back into the classroom. Okay. What year was that that you got to meet Quindarius Zachary? <clears throat> Can I recall right offhand? Probably around 2010, maybe. Okay. It was after, y'all. Did you establish any level of trust with the students? Would, would they come to you and talk? Well, hold on. That's right after. That's when they was actually going to court for it. So that means he was in, well, I knew all that. I knew they had to been in school, but I'm trying to pinpoint the actual schools. I need to narrow it down. You, um, about things that they were encountering. Yes, ma'am. As students. Yes, ma'am. And when you say you talked to them, um, did you talk with them only about scholastic things or did you talk with them about things like, getting involved with groups that they shouldn't get involved with. Yeah. yeah. They pry into the kids in neighborhoods and ask them what's going on, all these types of things. So they basically groom them to start telling. Seriously. So they ask the kids, yo, who y'all look up to? Who's who doing what? What cause they be in? They be asking weird questions to kids. So they technically be getting info, to be honest. And the kids is just giving it to him honestly because the adult is asking a question in a roundabout way. So won't he explain that? Yes, ma'am. All of the above. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Back then in 2010, um, did you 
see any signs of what you believe to be the formation of gang activity. Wow. Wow. Impressionable kids that look up the media that's being dropped on them by companies with misleading characters selling them things that's not even real. And she going to ask them about an 11 year old. Did you see that gangs? Wow. Within Crawford Long. I guess, ma'am. Okay. Now, what was it that you saw that led you to believe that? Um, the kids was constantly discussing um, the gang that was starting to sprout. They was calling themselves the Red Cartel. Yo. No, I heard you. It looks like Mr. Shirk's also about to say something. Same Same objection. Thing. Uh, overruled. You, you may continue. Yes, they would say something about a gang sprouting up called the, the Red Cartel. They was kids. And you really documented this information as being serious. Wow. You may continue. Okay. Um, they call themselves the Red Cartel, and they were becoming very prominent over in the Cleveland, Springfield, Spring, I'm sorry, Springdale. Hold on. You getting information from kids that's unknowingly giving you information about their neighborhoods that they live in, and you taking this and taking this back to the police force. But these was adults that it was in these gangs. And, whoa, hold on, cuz. Hold. Um, Cleveland Avenue area, Old Hateville area, Megan Drive area. Apart from hearing the name Red Cartel, did you see any indicators or signs of the ways that people calling themselves Red Cartel identify themselves? Uh, they mostly wear the color red. Oh. Oh. Whoa. I mean, then I mean, if you get them, if you get any bread color Jordans, make sure you don't wear red with that, cuz, cause you in. Yo, I ain't gonna lie, yo. Doing doing the color thing with red, red is a too popular color to be just throwing everybody in the group. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I ain't gonna go off if you got on red. You gotta have on layers of red for me to assume you a gang member. You feel me? Red chucks with red shoestrings. All right, now, now we talking. Now we talking. You feel me? Do you got on some red pants? You feel me with some red shoes? I might go ahead and say, "Oh, you feel me?" Not just one, just red. Nah, that's pedestrian style. No, you gotta have on a goddamn red dicky suit. Now I might say, "Oh, <laughs> you feel me?" I might say, "Oh, oh, cuz." Oh, no, nah, I ain't going to say cuz. Did you ever see them, without specifically showing any gang signs, did you ever see them display any signals that were um, seemingly unique to members of the group itself? Bro, them niggas was, good point. Yo, these police was called the Red Dogs. They gang? They literally was charged as a gang, I believe, was they? This is great. This the 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 ironic the irony the irony involved here. Yeah, that's where we at with it. This irony is crazy. No, I'm going to object to this line of questioning. I don't believe that there's a proper foundation for this witness. Your Honor, I'm. Is this the first time this witness has testified? Yes. Okay. You need to lay a foundation. Okay. Sustained. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. When you started out as a school resource officer. I'm definitely gang with this coat on. I mean, I, I might with this on. I feel like Suge Knight, to be honest. I'm big homie with this on. This a full length, y'all. Well, no, nah, it's about three quarters. Yeah, this come down to the knees, y'all. This is a real, yeah. So they going to think I'm really big homie. I come out with this on. With the Cartiers, and I come out walking down Cleveland. Now, they like, who the fuck is yo? <laughs> At Crawford Long Middle School. Um, would you describe for the jury what type of training that you had had with the Atlanta Police Department? Um, I had basic academy training along with... Um, Interviews, interviews, uh, interrogation, training, also um, burglary and robbery. And um, later during that tenure, I was transferred to the homicide unit, which I received numerous homicide classes and training. 
What training or experience did you have um, that caused you to form um, or to believe that you recognized gang activity when you saw it at Crawford Long Middle School? What? Um, basically just growing up. Um, I was, was prominent in Chicago. You're from Chicago? Yes, ma'am. All right. Oh! Southside. Now, what did you oh! see? growing up that caused you to believe that what you were looking at at Crawford Long were signs of gang activity? Um, it was the same standard. Um, kids would wear like red bandanas or clothing of red, something, some article on them with red. Cat. Uh, usually with the red bandana, we called it flagging. Cat. So people who you represented. Um, no, 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 no. What year this was? What year this was? They were, the what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's cat. I, once I receive that information, I notify the gang unit. Yeah. And I, yes, sir. I'm going to object to relevance, lack of foundation, and... No, let him go. No, Shark, you don't know nothing. Hey, 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 hey. Albino. <laughs> Albino homie, relax. Uh, this line of questioning, I don't believe it's going to lay a foundation. So that's why I'm saying relevance as well. Okay, overruled. Thank you. You may continue. Please speak to the jury. Okay. Um, at that time, I notified the Atlanta Police Gang Unit, and they confirmed that um, that it was. Yo, called the gang unit about middle school kids. Sustained without speaking specifically. Okay. They ain't break no law. About confirmation in particular instances, more broadly speaking, um, when you did see things that you believe were gang activity, did you notify the gang unit? Yes, I did, ma'am. Why did you do Yo. that? Yo! Uh, just, just to alert them and to get more information for myself. Yo, he worked in the school as an informant. This is illegal. This is illegal, bro. In talking with the kids uh, at Crawford Long Middle School, did they... Con Yo, he ain't taking them hooping. Yo getting information from them. I'm appalled. Fighting you about their involvement in, for instance, groups like Red Cartel. I'm not asking what they said. <laughs> Sustained. Okay. Without speaking specifically about what they said. Yo, listen. The police got this concept where they talk to the young bulls, right? Knowing that they will be the ones they will lock up later. This is literally in their protocol. I'm not lying. Police then pulled us up and told us. Literally. Inside of the speech of telling us that we will wind up being killed or go to jail if we stay on the streets. They will tell us that our goal is to stop y'all from turning into the dudes we wind up locking up later on. I'm telling you, bro. They taught to go out and go to this target market. I'm telling you, this is sick. What types of things beyond what you've already testified about um, did you gather from the students that allowed you to help them? Uh, navigate. Uh, Objection hearsay. Sustained. Okay. How often did you talk with students' parents? Um, usually when they come to pick up the kids or student got in trouble. And when you saw things that concerned you that you alerted the gang unit about, did you ever talk to the students' parents about those same things? No. Overruled. You may tell the jury. Um, the parents that were receptive of listening, there were some that wanted to hear, and there were some that didn't want to hear. Yo, who remember the um, police lady that's from Atlanta? What's her name? Not Underwood. Is it Underwood? Well, regardless, the gang expert.
Remember, she said she from Atlanta, and she said she ain't even see no gangs until they really put her on it, and they got turned into looking for gangs. Remember that? Yeah, remember she said they were just neighborhood little groups, you feel me? She understood it because the context, she's from Atlanta, right? But here we have it outside of that's really calling these boys gang members at goddamn 11 and 12. That's crazy, bro. Did you ever speak with groups of students or was it just individual ones about trying to stay out of or trying to avoid particular pitfalls? Your Honor, I am... Overruled. You can continue. Yes, I would talk to them in a group or talk to them individually. And were the subjects of the conversation always how to stay out of trouble? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Cap. Keep them out of, out of trouble by giving the them students, opportunities. The information that you had from growing up or other sources about gang activity. I was not talking about Gaither. We was talking about Underwood. We not talking about Gaither. I said she's from Atlanta. If you don't know who I'm talking about, that means you didn't watch the whole trial. Respectfully. Not talking about Gaither. I, I'm privy. <laughs> Please. Sustained. In what ways, beyond talking to the students, did you attempt to keep students from being involved in games? Sustained. Did the information that you were able to gather from the students in any way inform your investigations and ability to get information about in criminal investigations later on as a detective? Yes, ma'am. Uh, he just told How? himself. Uh, so, Ho, you mean to tell me that you was in a middle school working as a uh, school police? And then you use information you used in that, you learned in that capacity to further your investigations in your police work and you call yourself helping the community? Oh, yeah. Ah. Um, I developed rapport with, with several of the kids. Um, a trust was, was, was formed and they would. If At the same time, have, did you arrest any of their brothers or family members? Just asking, do you have any cases on any of your students, family members at the same time you was working in this school? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. <laughs> they see me out on the scene. Uh oh. Anywhere near that, they'll come to me next day in school and say, hey, officer. Generally speaking. Yes. They would come to you and would they offer you information? Yes, ma'am. Other than Quindarius Zachary. Yo, what's the coincidence they working in the school, the mall, and where else? The club. Psh. The police work at the schools, the mall, and the clubs. Um, are you familiar, were you familiar with any other persons that, um, through your investigation? If you're watching this on the playback, let me know in the comments if the police work at the schools. <laughs> a clubs in the goddamn uh, malls where you live at. Really. Like in the key spots where you just could run across the major players. So if you're in Neiman Marcus and them, you're catching the people from the street just coming in here spending a whole bunch of bread. You could spot them a mile away. Look at them coming in here shopping like you're ignorant. That's too many back. Regular people don't even shop like this. Look at, man, listen. Man, listen. Investigation in this case that you came in contact with. Yes, ma'am. Who were you familiar with during your time as a school resource officer? Yes, sir. I'm going to object under 404A. <clears throat> What's your response?
Your Honor, I'm not certain what exactly the... Maybe tailor your question. Okay. What other persons uh, did you know during your time as a school resource officer that you also interacted with or taught or gain knowledge about during this case? Same objection, Your Honor. Okay. Do you understand the objection? Can you tailor your... Did you know any other... Trontavia Stevens. Did you know Trontavia Stevens? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What age did you learn about or did you meet Trontavia Stevens? Uh, age 11. Was he Whoa. a student as well? Yes, ma'am. Was he a student at Crawford Long Middle School? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you know Shannon Stillwell as a, as a young person? No, I did not know Shannon Stillwell. Did you know Diamante Kendricks? I knew of him. I never had any interaction of, with him. Did you know of him as a young child? Yes, I think as he was getting to high school, yes. What, what about Quentin Porter? Did you know of him? Yes, ma'am. What? And was he a young child or was he an older person when you got to know him or uh, knew of him? I believe I met him when he was in seventh or eighth grade. Okay. Of the people that you've named so far that you met, did you interact with them in the same way that you did with Quindarius Zachary or did they not talk with you as much? Um, uh, they talked they, they talk with me, um, but um, that was about it. They, they, they talked, but they never. Okay. All right. What year was it that you were promoted? So he talked with the same dudes that he wound up getting to tell later on. What? So when these kids was kids, yo was introduced into their lives? What? Noted to a homicide detective. 2004. And during your time as a homicide detective, have you been uh, recognized or uh, given? So you worked in the school when you was a homicide detective. And some of these kids. Hold on, bro. Boo told around this time, y'all. Bro, if he met Boo in middle school, in what year? Yo, Boo told like 2007, I think, bro. Bro. Any special um, awards for your work as a homicide detective? Yes, ma'am. Objection yes, ma tell the relevance. Sustained. Right. Would you tell the jury? Bro, he worked around these kids during the bloody summer and afterwards, y'all. So he worked around the kids when they was doing the smashing grabs, y'all. Think about that. It's not his timeline, not in at the always literally a plant, y'all. Do y'all see this? The time periods he talking, he working around these kids. Do you know what they brothers and, and, and goddamn uncles and shit is doing? Do y'all know what this mean? I don't think y'all understand what this mean, bro. Pay attention to these dates Holmes is saying and think about all these timelines and how I've been pointing out, y'all. Look, these these people is connected to these people. Look. It looked like, you feel me? I done already pointed out mad connections between people and put it on the timeline, bro. But if we think about it, all these boys, brothers and big homies is is out in the streets getting busy, right? While he talking to them and they they got their foot in the streets, barely right, jump off the porch. And he just in a prime position to catch them when they not outside. Think about that, y'all. Think about that. How many homicides you've investigated during your time as a homicide detective? close to over maybe as lead and assistant, probably close to 300, maybe more than that. Now, were all of these within the city of Atlanta, or did you ever have an occasion to uh, interact with or investigate uh, crimes that were outside the city of Atlanta, but connected with crimes that you were investigating? Yo, and this is why we got the hints. We got all these rats, y'all. They literally groomed more rats and separated them from the real big homies, y'all. Look at what they did. And it looked like they targeted Zone 3. Golly. Golly. Hey, yo. As far as the land of Zone 3, that's the area that really needed to be gentrified. And Mechanicsville was already being gentrified, right? Ugh. And the city of Atlanta. Yes, you know, um, Got part of Atlanta is also in DeKalb County, so I worked some cases that was 
a letter to DeKalb County and also a letter to Fulton County. Yo, listen, in order to gentrify an area, you need the crime to go up 10 years prior to the time you start rebuilding for the gentrification. True or false? Golly. Would you describe for the jury some of the training that you received as a homicide detective uh, that allowed you to perform your duties that was different than the training you received as a patrol officer or a burglary detective? Yes, um, interviews and interrogations, um, reading crime scenes, um, logging things, um, crime scene processing. And as a homicide detective, were you involved in investigations uh, that related to purported gang activity? I repeat that again, ma'am. As a homicide detective, did you ever... It, did your investigations ever involve gang activity? The yes, homicide investigation? Yes, ma'am. Oh, they infiltrated the barbershops too. My bad. Now, did you share information with other law enforcement officers as it related to gang-related homicides? Yes, ma'am. And how, if ever you were trained to recognize gang activity while you were performing your investigations, how did? what kind of training have you received? Um... It was the processing of the scene, um, doing thorough background checks on the on the victim or witnesses, um, finding out different incidents may have happened at the location prior to the homicide incident. Did your rapport with community members aid you in furthering your investigations as it related to potential Objection gang leading. homicides? Objection, what? Leading. Sustained. What about your interactions with the community, if anything, helped you learn more when you were investigating gang-related homicides? Uh, yes. Um, I would go and talk to people that lived in the area of the incident. And um, at that time, they're, I take them to the side and have a low-key conversation with them, and they advise me of so because you had worked with them before when they was kids, they, they were more keen to talking and communicating with you because you had communication with them like you was a coach, which you were sent in to basically be a, a guidance counselor for kids that were in the area you worked as a homicide detective. I ain't gonna lie, bro. That's dirty work, bro. You worked at a school that the kids from the zone where you worked as a homicide officer attended. Wow. I smell a lawsuit. Where the lawyers at? Sure is a lot of lawyers streaming this trial. And I sure don't hear them pointing out issues like this. I sure would like to hear what they got to say about this. Which is what they've been hearing or this is what they know. Did you always uh, identify the people who gave you information as witnesses? Or were there times when people gave you information and didn't want to be identified? Correct. There's several times people want to give information, but they want to get involved any further than that. And did you respect their wishes not to be involved or did you list them and sort of out them as having given you information? No, I, I respect their wishes. Okay. Huh? Would you tell the oh, jury oh, oh, as bad, a homicide detective how it is that you come to be assigned to any particular homicide? Are there are times when you identify the people or this is what they know. Conversation with um, At that time, I take them to the side and have a low-key conversation with them and they advise me of well, this is what they've been hearing or this is what they know. Did you always uh, identify the people who gave you information as witnesses or were there times when people gave you information and didn't want to be identified? Correct. There's several times people want to give information but they want to get informed. Who giving you information? involved any further than that and did you respect their wishes not to be involved or did you list them and sort of out them as having given you information no i, I respect their wishes okay would you tell the jury as a homicide detective how it is that you come to be assigned to any particular homicide uh but we have an atlanta police homicide unit it's called a rotation a unit rotation so it doesn't matter if you work one of the other shifts day watch which is 7 a.m to, to 5 p.m or evening watch, which is 2 to 12 midnight. Um, it's kind of like a pitcher rotation in baseball. Um, if you catch a case today, you're not, to catch, you're not due to catch a case until you come back up. Okay. So say there's 30 detectives, 
if you're number one, you go down to number 30. Number two becomes number one. Number three comes number two. And it goes like that. So it doesn't matter if you're off um, or it's past your, your shift time. If the call comes up, you have to come in and respond to it. And during the time that you're not up, is that the time that you're able to investigate whatever homicides that you do catch on your rotation? Yes, ma'am. All right. So she just went from you was working in a middle school while you were a homicide detective in the area that you're working as a detective. And then she wrote to people giving up information. Is she crazy? Is she crazy? When you arrive on a scene of a homicide, are there any particular uh, steps that you take to jumpstart your investigation? Uh, upon arriving, um, I try and brief with the responding, first responding officers and um, first responding uh, detective on, on the scene, see what information he or she has gathered prior to my arrival. Is it, is it your practice? Has it been your practice to attempt to identify witnesses on scene if there are any? Yes, ma'am. Yo. I'm confused, bro. This lady case just jumped from middle school students to witnesses. I know that jury got to be like, what What just happened? Yo just established himself as being a, a, a middle school police. And now we're talking about witnesses. And how, what, what? Is it your practice to identify or attempt to identify surveillance footage if there is any? Yes, ma'am. How do you go about determining whether or not there's surveillance footage at a particular location? Uh, we walk around and you try and see if there's cameras uh, fixated on the, on the structures or um, you go inside and see if there's uh, door ring cameras on some of the residents or you go inside a business and see if they have a camera that may be facing out their front windows. As the lead detective, do you uh, delegate responsibilities in the investigation of the homicides that you're responsible for or do you handle every aspect of that investigation? We delegate. What types of activities do you delegate to other persons? Um, depending on how many um, homicide detectives on the scene, I have them do what is called a neighborhood canvas. Mm -hmm. They automatically go around, start, start knocking and talking to people and also looking for surveillance cameras, things of that nature. And do you work with the VIT unit um, to determine whether or not there are... Do you ever work with the VIT unit? I have a role. Yes. And how long have you worked with the VIT unit? Uh, since their first inception and, and, and coming into work with the APD, um, we usually call down and ask them, do, do they have any big cameras in the immediate area? And they're able to tell us they have cameras at this location, either facing north, east, south, or west. At that time, we give them the time frame of the incident, and they're able to go back and take a look and see exactly if they have any footage of anything that may be relevant to our homicide investigation. Yo, he was a homicide detective that was thrown into a middle school to work under the guise of being a school resource officer. But in reality, he was there to get information on the community. Yeah. Straight up, bro. It's obvious. You can't send the detectives to go in the neighborhood to talk to the kids. But the kids will talk to the police because they just ramble. So you got to loosely set them up with different questions until somebody tell the kids to stop goddamn talking to the law. If you look online, you can see mad videos of people going in communities of the trenches and talking with the youth and getting a scope of what's going on. Is there any shootings? They like, yeah, it was shooting just last night right over there by my house. You feel me? I heard the shot, but I'm used to it because it happened all the time. Yeah, like I'm telling you, I watch a lot of footage, y'all. If you look, these people is going and getting strategic information. And what's the coincidence? It's been the same information for 50 years. Yeah. Go back and watch some old footage in the 70s where they go in the, in the projects and talk to the kids. Watch what they ask them. Watch what they ask them. I swear to God. They asking them about with the action. Yo, is it too many drugs, too much drugs around? Yeah, yeah, I ain't gonna lie. Can you get, could you buy some drugs? Could the kids get their hands on drugs? I swear to God. Where the drug dealers be? I, man, I ain't making this up. The number of bit cameras remains constant over the time that you've worked as a homicide detective? No, ma'am. Would you explain? You a head kid on there like, yeah, it'd be my brother and them be out there. Everybody in my neighborhood sell drugs out front. I mean, it ain't even, I'm telling you, bro, if you go look, they been doing this, sending people that appear to be innocent coming in like they just got the camera and, and the whole time they stacking up information. 
Guess what? Just like Miko Worldwide. Same thing, bro. But you keep asking people that's not on camera. Yo, what's your name? Tell a, tell a camera, tell the people on the camera your name. But you done snuck in the neighborhood under the guise of you want to talk to the rappers. But the whole time it's a hood vlog where you show everybody doing regular day things. Pay attention. Pay attention. Now they've not remained constant. Have uh, they increased, decreased? A uh, very increased because of the success of those of the video integration camera systems. Because of the what now? The video integration um, camera system that is, is increased because of their, their reliability. Okay. Would you explain to the jury whether license plate readers and Vic cameras are the same or different? Uh, they're different. The license plate reader picks up on a tag of a vehicle, stores it in. And monitors where all regular civilians are going, and it can track you just in case. It's tracking you all the time. Yeah, regular civilians all through the city being tracked. Yeah, license plate readers. Yeah, reading everybody junk. Know exactly where you went. So technically, they never mind. <laughs> they would tell you exactly what direction that that vehicle has been traveling, what other LPR readers it has hit on, so you can go back and backtrack to see exactly where that vehicle may have started or came from. Is there any particular information you'd need to be able to track a vehicle with license plate readers? Uh, sometimes we're able to give a make and model mm -hmm. and description of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And once again, uh, the LPR um, teams are able to go in and say, okay, we found this vehicle. It looks like the vehicle you're talking about. We see that the license plate reader is showing that it was in the immediate area at the time of the incident. Okay. Now, have license plate readers um, always been in effect within the city of Atlanta during your time? No, ma'am. And do you know or remember when you all first would have had access to license plate readers? I want to say probably around maybe 2018, 2019. What? Has the number of license plate readers since that time that you things been out. remain constant, increased, decreased, or something in the middle? Hold on. If Atlanta ain't get them things till 2018, he crazy. That's crazy. I'm going to keep it real. Increased. And what... How, do you know how it's determined where a license plate reader will be placed? No, the license plate reader is literally just scanning your tag like you just went through the toll booth or something. It's scanning your tag, just watching you go through certain lights and intersections. So it can tell where you done basically went throughout the day. Now, they got them on all the main roads, so you can't go too far without being scanned. You feel me? Like, you got to get up on the back blocks to not get scanned. And if you're in a major city, ain't no back block. You understand? Ain't no real back block. You're going to hit one. Within two, two, two turns or, or a couple lights, you're going to hit one. Ain't no way. It got it set. I'm telling you, it's nice. Just look up. Yeah, when you get at the red light, just look up. They the skinny joints. Yeah, ain't the red, it, ain't the, it ain't flagging you because you ran the red light. Nah, it's just there, chilling. You know what I mean? Now, some of them look real aggressive. These, the stolen car, the, um, the, the, these trackers is for stolen cars. Look, yeah, it's multiple, bro. Come on, bro. I've been paying attention. Listen, my city is a test city. We got all of them on the, on the drones. I'm telling y'all. <laughs> I'm telling y'all. I'm on them. I see them when they come. Like, what the? What is that? Oh, they got four cameras up there. Yeah. Yeah. So they got the, the car theft ones, the regular ones, and then they got the, the cameras that's on crime. Then they got the hotspot sound system. Listening for the gunshot. No, I, um, I tend to think that it's based on the high activity of traffic or whatever in that particular. Oh, and the drone. There and also the crimes. The permanent drone. Constant. Not we sent it up. No, it's always up. Yeah. During that area. And does the Atlanta Police Department decide where license plate readers will be placed? Um, I believe it's, it's decided by City Hall and, and the police department talking together. All right. And what about video integration unit cameras, VIC cameras? Who decides where those will be placed? Same thing. I think it's a joint collaboration between City Hall and the Atlanta Police Department. All right. Do you obtain knowledge about whether license plate readers caught any particular information in the same way or different than you get information about VIC cameras? Um, or to ask a better question, how do you learn whether or not there are license plate readers that may have captured something you need in your investigation? Uh, once again, we'll call and see. Sustained. Your Honor, um, how do you know where the license plate readers are that might have captured something of interest in your investigation? We call the unit and they'll tell us they, they, if they have a license plate reader in the immediate area and they'll tell us exactly where it's positioned okay. and what direction it's facing. All right. 
Would you describe for the jury where the Summer Hill community is located? It's located off of um, our, uh, Rob David Abernathy and McDaniel Glen area. Okay. Down where the old Fulton County Turner Field used to be. Okay. How much time have you spent working in that area? I would say majority of my, the whole entire my career, 30 years. Okay. Are you familiar with the Castleberry Hills area? Yes, ma'am. Right. And how often have you worked in that area? Um, per my patrol as a red dog officer and responding as a burglary detective, robbery detective, and homicide detective. 330 McDaniel Street. What area is that in? That is the Zone 1, Zone 5 area. This is like a border. Okay. And what... When you say border, is it a border between different communities? No, it's, it's a border between the zones. Okay. What communities make up that area? It's both uh, residential, apartment buildings, businesses. Okay. And is 330 McDaniel Street in Fulton County? Yes, it is, ma'am. Did you have an occasion to respond to that location on January 10th, 2015? Yes, ma'am. What time, if you recall, did you respond? Um, I believe I received the call around 9.30 p.m. from uh, Detective Darren Smith of the Atlanta Police Homicide Unit. Um, he advised me to do a three-subject shot at that location. Are you called only when there is a confirmed death, or are you called before you know whether or not someone has died? Um, it depends on the status of the paramedics when they transport. If they say the person is low critical, we respond because there's a good chance that they might not survive once they get down to Grady. When you responded on January 10th, 2015, um, did you have any confirmed deaths? Not, not until I arrived on the scene. What information or what were you responding to? I was responding to three subjects that were shot. Um, one is low critical, one, one is in critical condition, one is in critical but stable condition. And would you tell the jury what the names of those three subjects were? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the first subject that was in critical condition was Donovan Thomas. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I pronounce their names right. You might want to look at my notes. Uh, no, and okay. if you, uh, I'll hand you a copy of your report. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, the second subject that was in critical condition was Reginald Hendricks, and the third that was in critical but stable was Cardarius Sanders. Now, did you have an opportunity when you arrived on scene to speak with either of those three people? No, ma'am. They were already transported to Grady. All right. When you arrived on scene, had the scene already been cordoned off or roped off? Yes, ma'am. And when you arrived on scene, was there any other homicide detective already there assisting or directing? Yes, ma'am. Um, detective Smith was on scene. Now, was Detective Smith up in the rotation? Or was no, ma'am. No, ma so when a detective is not up in rotation, how is it that one homicide detective would be working a scene before you if it's your homicide yes ma'am um, that depending on how many subjects how many detectives are working that day mm -hmm. um there's a lead detective that will go out to the scene um gather the information start processing and they'll notify the next up um homicide detective that there's a call and there's three subjects like on this day three subjects that were shot okay. how familiar with you were the air with the area of 330 mcdaniel street before you got that call on january 10th 2015 very familiar had you ever interacted with persons in that area on a casual basis as opposed to during an investigation? Yes, ma'am, during an investigation. Did, and when you say during an investigation, is it only during investigations that you interacted with persons in that area? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just about. Yes, ma'am. Were there or was there an apartment complex in that area? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember the name of the apartment complex? No, not the top of my head, no. Okay. I believe that one across the street, down the street, was Castleberry Apartments. Okay. Were you familiar with or had you had any occasion to um, visit or be familiar with Castleberry Hills Apartments? Yes, ma'am. When you got on scene, did you make any efforts to locate surveillance footage? Yes, ma'am. Tell the jury what efforts you took to locate surveillance footage. Um, immediately in that caught my attention was there was cameras uh, fixed on the barbershop um, at 330 McDaniel Street. Um, also, I noticed that there were surveillance cameras down at the gas station at the intersection of uh, McDaniel Street and Northside Drive. Was it daytime, nighttime, something in the middle when you arrived on scene? Um, I did not ask that question. Well, no. we know, yeah, we, we know the time, so. 
Let me ask a better question. Was there daylight, moonlight? Was there natural light for you to see on scene when you arrived there? No, it, the street was um, lit up with uh, city city lights. Okay. And how were you able to see um, the cameras that you were able to identify? Uh, they were just fixed on the building, so you can look up and see right. the cameras. At the time that you saw them, did you know whether or not they were working? No, I did not. Did you take steps to find out? Yes, I talked to the owners. All right. And when that happens, are you able to get the camera footage on scene immediately, or do you do something to get that footage? Yes, ma'am. Um, I contact the cybercrimes unit who goes out and retrieve all type of video surveillance for us. Detective Teague, are you familiar with Detective Teague? Yes, ma'am. And what does Detective Teague do for you during your investigation? Uh, Detective Teague went to those different locations and downloaded um, the video surveillance from those locations. I gave him the dates and the times. Okay. Did you, at the time, know whether there were, or did you learn if there were any surveillance cameras at the apartments across the street from 330 McDaniel Street? Um, as I walked over there um, the next day, I saw that there was no cameras facing McDaniel Street. And what other efforts, if any, did you take to get surveillance footage or any kind of um, captured footage of what happened at 330 McDaniel Street? Um, it was just those two locations that had cameras. Okay. When you said that you went to the Texaco, where were you focusing? Where was it that you understood the shooting to have occurred? Um, the shooting happened right in front of the barbershop. Um, the vehicle was traveling down McDaniel Street to Northside Drive and made a right onto Northside Drive. And that placed it right in the path of the Texaco cameras. Okay. How did you learn what the vehicle did without saying anything that anyone specific told you, how did you learn? Uh, people that was on the scene. Okay. And at the time, on scene, the night of January 10, 2015, did you get any specific details about the make and model of the car? Any definitive details? No, ma'am, except that it was probably a silver or a light gray colored vehicle. Okay. When the Atlanta Police Department investigates a homicide, um, do they have ways of soliciting information from the public that might assist in the investigation? Yes, uh, we have what is called the Crime Stoppers Hotline. Um, information given that leads to a uh, portion of the investigation or successful arrest of the investigation is a $2,000 reward for any information given. And where do you display that? Do you put it on TV? Do you put it in newspapers or something else? Um, it's, it's displayed on TV. And also we post flyers around the neighborhood. Did you do this with the McDaniel Street murder that you investigated? Yes, ma'am. What was it that you put on TV? Um, basically, uh, there was a subject that came inside with an assault rifle when I identified who that person was, but they were not on scene when I got there. Now, when you say a subject that came inside with an assault rifle, inside where? The barbershop. I'm sorry, the barbershop. And why did you put that particular footage on? Because uh, I want to see what this person uh, was a person of interest that may be related to the shooting itself, that he may have been one of the shooters. Did you later learn whether that person had any relationship to either of the victims? Yes. And what did you learn that person's relationship was to either of the victims? Um, I learned um, through the parent that that was their son and the brother of the decedent. Okay. Other than the footage of the person going into the barbershop, did you have any other footage displayed on television to try and help in your investigation? Um, I believe we just closed captioned the screen of the vehicle coming by. We didn't show the actual shooting mm -hmm. itself, just the vehicle. And when you say closed caption the screen, did you do a still shot or did you play a portion of a video surveillance? Yes, what we did, we condensed it down so that the shot would just show that's the vehicle coming down the street. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a couple of still shots in there of the vehicle, but we never showed the, the victims getting shot themselves. Right. And did you show footage from the barbershop or the Texaco? The barbershop. Did you ever display any footage from the Texaco on TV? No, ma'am. All right. How do you decide which footage you're going to put out there and which footage you're going to hold back? Um, based on the relevance, uh, because the Texaco did not show the actual shooting itself. The barbershop did. Okay. To your knowledge, did you all get Crime Stoppers calls or people calling in after you put up the video from in front of the barbershop? Yes, ma'am. When you arrived on scene, were there people who were willing to talk with you and uh, have their names 
listed as witnesses. There were people willing to talk, but they didn't want to list their names. And how did they make that known to you? Uh, simply by giving me the information. And I said, you want to come down and talk to me? And they're like, no, that's all from as far as I'm, I'm getting involved. This is what, this is who was involved. 